A boy in a glittery gold shirt lay back on the gaudily floral and bloodstained sofa in a private ecstasy after binging on the teary sadness often promoted by a cheap bottle of red wine. An endless series of videos where first love's affections played through a grimy projector and fish hooks tied around the bare curtain rail pulling the flesh of his shoulders upwards. An orange butterfly sucked on his brown iris through the small gap between his almost closed eyelids. He opened them when its wings flapped, took a photo with the camera built into his eye and returned to the euphoria of a a post-fix cocoon. The boy hadn't always been like this. Once he had sat on a cleaner version of the worn sofa playing FIFA with friends, fumbling clumsily with adolescent crushes and watching panoramas on obesity while he ate Iceland chicken dippers coated in own brown ketchup with his mum. Since he was 13, none of these audiences, in any of their incarnations, had ever seen him cry. He resented the thought of looking weak, and thought that tears looked too small coming from his deep-set eyes and too weak spasming his broad frame. When he had gotten a text about his pet Labrador, Luke, dying, 40 se- f- dying 47 days after his 13th birthday, his first ugly weep had echoed off and around the high ceilings of his boarding school's chapel, amplified for the audience beneath it to hear. By lunch, people were coming up to him and miming crying with cheeks wet with tap water. Little bottles with genuine crybaby tears sold for 20p outside the dining room. They were promising the ability to bring back animals from the grave. Now he sat on his sofa, now he sat on his sofa, creating ever and ever more elaborate and ingenious methods to wrench tears from his eyes. The day he had been given the all clear, having spent 48 hours in hospital after getting his bionic eye, the 17th one of his friends to do so, he had played rugby against Staines RC on a pitch that was still soaking from yesterday's rain. The first thing he filmed by flicking his eyes twice to the right was the winning try he scored. As he slid over the try line, he hit a puddle which splashed muck- mucky water into his new eye. At first he panicked, thinking he had damaged his new treasured and ingrained toy. Then he felt the reflexive tears, whose job it was to remove any bacteria, come. He wiped them away, couldn't spot or feel any damage, and so began celebrating. There was lots of cheap red wine that evening. As he flexed, putting the skin a little further from his back, he reminisced about the carousel of people who had tried their specific forms of leverage to get him to come back to them through the apathetic fog of his bingy crying. His mother's coughed pleadings about childhood innocence, his girlfriend's evocation of his previous beauty, his friend's emotional blackmail. And then he put on the closing scenes of the notebook as he began to wrap some sterilised barbed wire around his arm. Part 2 Wide Eyed the company that had first cracked the enigma of how to grate video and in- video and photo hardware into a bionic eyeball that wouldn't be rejected by the body had been understandably idiotic in three interconnected respects when developing eyes fit for the future of social media. Firstly, they had overseen the third type of tear. They had focused all their energy on the first two types, basal and reflective. Basal tears lubricated the eyeball so the lid could pass it in a normal blinking motion. Reflexive tears allowed the eyeball to clean itself when it was exposed to dirt. Due to tight budgets, an increasingly overshot deadline, and a celebratory stupor at solving the practical issues, the emotional tear had escaped their awareness. Secondly, and because of this, they had not considered the therapeutic effect of the emotional tear. Too late, and when one of the employees reached the tragic conclusion of Titanic without crying for the first time in their life, leaving him in an emotional limbo, they realised that tears were therapeutic because they contained cortisol, prolactin and other other stress-inducing hormones, and so calmed an individual when they were shed. However, they could not wire the eye directly into these hormonal glands without causing a PR shitstorm, and so chose instead to give an active kick out of crying providing a counter-pleasure in response to emotional trauma, rather than relieving it by crying out the hormones that caused it. When a sufficient amount of stress hormones were detected, the eye released a small quantity of a newly synthesized opiate that, in lab conditions, had proven to match the calming effects of crying. It wasn't announced to the world.
They just added a narcotic to the bottles customers had to fill the eye with on a daily basis. The eye was smart enough to distribute it when it was needed, unless the people were imprudent enough to abuse it. Thirdly, they hadn't considered the response of the Julia butterfly, one of the few insects known to get its necessary sodium from tears and sweat. The Natural History Museum had forgotten, had forgotten to put the necessary sodium in the water fed to the insects for the Sensational Butterflies exhibition that summer. Given the epidemic of crying addiction plaguing our city, when two of the species escaped on a Hello Kitty backpack, it didn't take them long to begin to feed off the tears of addiction or the sweats of withdrawal. One more of society grew more creative in their methods of masochism, because tears of sorrow were easier to summon than tears of joy. The corpses of butterflies began to litter the streets, being trod on by rubber soles of business shoes and black high heels alike. They were allergic to the opiate, allergic to the same reason everyone else was indulgent. Thank you.